This is Mona Tanja, president of NCSM, and welcome to Learning with Leaders, the Bold Mathematics Leadership Series. Join me as I sit down and have conversations with emerging and established leaders exploring equity in action. You will hear from bold mathematics leaders as they share their experiences and actions and what they have learned from them. We think these next few minutes will help you consider the bold actions that you can take to focus on equity and support those that you serve. Grab a warm cup of coffee and a journal as we learn together on our mathematics leadership journey. Hello, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders. John San Giovanni and I are the co-hosts for the Bold Mathematics Leadership Series. To finish up the Bold Leadership Series, we have invited speakers to sit down with us and discuss what equity means to them and share with us their experiences and stories of leadership actions that support our journeys as math leaders. We have two special guests today, Dr. Shelley Jones and Georgina Rivera. Gina and Shelley are two of the authors on the writing team on the upcoming Essential Action Series book from NCSM, Leading Culturally Relevant Pedagogy in Mathematics Education. Dr. Shelley Jones is a professor of mathematics education at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut. Before jo joining the CCSU faculty, I said that right, <laughs> Dr. Jones was a middle school math teacher and a mathematics supervisor in K-12 education. She provides mathematics professional development locally, nationally, and internationally. Dr. Jones serves her community by working with various professional and community organizations on a national level. This is where I know her best. She is the position papers editor of NCSM, a member of NCTM and the president elect for the Benjamin Banneker Association. A focus of Dr. Jones' current work is on culturally relevant pedagogy and mathematics. She has shared her passions during a CCSU TED talk and live radio interviews. She is a contributing author of the book entitled The Brilliance of Black Children in Mathematics, Beyond the Numbers and Towards a New Discussion. And she's the author of which if you're watching this live, you can see the picture of the book behind her, uh, the author of Women Who Count, Honoring African-American Women Mathematicians, a children's activity book. Then we have Georgina Rivera with us today, and she is a passionate math educator, presenter, and leader. Currently, she is an administrator at Green Hill Schools in Bristol, Connecticut. Prior to this position, she was the district's elementary STEM supervisor, a K-5 math coach, and began her career as a middle school mathematics teacher. She presents at the district straight state and national level on best practices in mathematics, teaching and learning, culturally relevant math and coaching. She was a recipient of the Bristol Teacher of the Year Award and the first recipient of the Charlene Tate Nichols Award for contributions to mathematics education in the state of Connecticut. Along with her role as an administrator, she serves on several boards, including Ed Report's Mathematics Advisory Panel, Math Teacher Circles for Social Justice, She's a teacher leader fellowship and the NCSM board. She serves the NCSM board as the professional learning director. She was recently, ta-da, elected <laughs> as the NCSM second vice president and will begin her two year term in September. So we are super excited to have both of them with us today. So welcome Gina and Shelley. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank for you so much. Today. So we're going to start with the, the, the question we've been asking all of our present, all of our guests, what does equity mean to you? So Shelly, do you want me to start or do you want to start? Yeah, go ahead. Start Gina. Okay. So as I think about equity in math education, I really think about some of the things that people have been saying along the way in the podcast, and it's really giving each and every child exactly what they need to succeed in math education. And when I think about that deeply as a leader, that means I need to engage all the stakeholders I work with. So for kids to be successful in math, I know math teachers can't do that alone. It's going to take pair educators, it's going to take special education staff, EL staff, and myself as an instructional leader to really develop my skills to be able to give feedback and coach teachers so they're all teaching to the rigor of the standard. So giving each and every child what they need, it means all hands on deck. Like I need every hand I can get to support me to make that happen along with the classroom teacher. And so how will I know if that happens? If we can eliminate the word subgroups, I know we've gotten there. Like I, I want that word eradicated where all students are performing at high levels. 
But if I think about this holistically, like math teachers sometimes feel like they take it upon themselves. I know myself as a math teacher, I thought I had to do it all by myself. And what I realized is it takes the village of the whole school community plus stakeholders. And I know Shelly's gonna say more about that. Okay, well, what I'll add to what Gina says is, we have to see the value in each and every child and the brilliance that they bring to the classroom. So that's what equity means to me, is looking at each child and what they bring to the classroom. They each have different strengths. If we only use one measuring stick, we're not gonna see that, that brilliance in each and every child. And so we need to see what they come in with, and then we need to use that in our instruction. And that means also using different types of strategies to engage students. So our teaching has to become multifaceted. Many teachers know about differentiated instruction. Well, we're gonna be on steroids with differentiated instruction because we really need to catch every student where they are. And that doesn't mean, um, it, it really means um, figuring out where their strengths lie. That's a really big deal, figuring out where their strengths lie and then figuring out what do we need to do, of course, with assistance, with help, with support, with our village. What do we need to do as teachers? How can we as leaders help teachers do what they need to do for each and every child? And I know that that sounds sort of like, okay, everyone says that, but we really mean each and every child and the brilliance that they bring. What is their value that they bring to the classroom? And again, Having the stakeholders means we're gonna hear their voices, right? We're gonna uh, create opportunities where we hear the voices of all of our stakeholders and they need to have a voice in the curriculum that we use in our math classrooms. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, so many things to follow up with, but I, I'm interested in both of you for just a moment and your brilliance <laughs> is shown on your work together on the NCSM um, Board of Directors. And um, tell me a little bit more about both of you. How do you how to know each other um, before your time on the NCSM Board? All right, who starts this time, Shelly? Do I? I'll okay, you start with the story. I sent the story. PCS <laughs> Do too. <laughs> yeah, good story, good one. Yeah, so I was recruited by a professor at CCSU to do this new program. It was called a six-year math ed leadership. It's not very common. I knew I wanted to be an administrator, but when they said math education, I was drawn to that program. So one of the courses was culturally relevant math, and I had never heard of it. So I was a student of Dr. Shelley Jones, and I learned about culturally relevant pedagogy from Dr. Jones. So this is really a full circle moment for me. And it was sad because we were a very close cohort. And I think Dr. Jones will talk about this. We called ourselves the math family and I was the mom of that family. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> and in that family, when we graduated, I really missed Shelly because Shelly really opened up my eyes to something that I am so passionate about that today. So that's how I first met Dr. Jones. I call her Shelly now because she's my friend. Back then when she was my professor, it was Dr. Jones. Well, yeah, and all, all of that is true. And, you know, I didn't know at first that this was new to Gina because when she picks up on something, she begins to do her own research. And so she began to learn about it. And we talked about it and we said, well, let's do, I think Gina was the one that invited me to do a session with at CREC. Well, mm -hmm. so we started there and then we did one at NCSM at, at the, one of the um, conferences. So, I mean, Gina went full steam ahead as soon as she learned about culturally relevant. And one of the reasons why is because what I learned was that Gina had suffered as a child, as an English language learner coming up and also just her identity. Her identity was missing in the classroom. Not only was it missing, but she really felt that she was, her, her culture was sort of put down on, you know, her culture was looked at in a way that Gina didn't recognize it, right? And, and probably teachers didn't realize that. But sometimes that's, that's why you have to know who's in your classroom. You have to know who they are, what is their culture, you know, where are their strengths, like we talked about. And so it started there, and then Gina and I began to work together doing sessions. Um, and then 
you know, we got so busy doing our own lives and our own um, careers, we sort of lost touch, like Gina said, but then all of a sudden I found out she was on the NCSM board. I don't remember which state we were in, but here we are, we both live in Connecticut and we don't see each other until we're out of state with the NCSM. And so that was great when I got to see her again and, and, and work with her again. Um, and, and we've been working together ever since. And like you said, we're working on that culturally relevant um, math task book. And I just, just to work together and hear the, our ideas, how we bounce each off of each other's ideas. I think that's what people need. They need that village. So leaders need the village, but so do teachers. Because when you begin to discuss things, aspects of the, the, the culturally relevant math tasks, we're trying to revise tasks to create more culturally relevant tasks. And we kind of think, oh, you know, just introduce culture. And it's not as easy as it seems. And so that's how we learn. We learn, okay, what are the things that we're doing as, as we revise these tasks? What are the questions we're asking each other? this is what leaders need to know so that when they're working with teachers, they know these are the questions that you need to ask teachers to reflect on and to think about their students in such ways that they can create these tasks that tie in and that use the strengths of their students. Here's, the, well, here's what's interesting as I'm listening to you guys, first of all, kind of sharing your journey, you know, as you're growing together through this process is, um, I'm going to go back to the uh, Shelly, you mentioned in your idea around equity, this idea around brilliance, right? That each student brings brilliance with them into the classroom. And I've heard you talk about culturally relevant tasks and culturally relevant pedagogy. So let's step back for a second. And what is that? So for readers that are not, or readers, listeners who are not familiar with that, what is it? And, and, and why, why should we be doing it? I mean, I've heard little bits and pieces of it, but let's hear kind of the full picture here. Okay. Well, um, first I'm gonna start with the why. Why do we need culturally relevant pedagogy? Because what we're using right now is not working for many students. We're losing many students. Students don't see no. the sense in the math that they're doing in classrooms. They think math is this thing that you do at a desk and you get an answer. What the answer tells you, they really don't care right? So culturally relevant pedagogy is actually a few things, right? It's an approach to teaching that honors the students. I mean, can you even imagine honoring students? I mean, I honor my grandmother. So I had to think about this word, honoring students. You're honoring their cultures. You're honoring what they bring to the classroom. You're honoring their communities, right? So one of the things that it does is it honors the students. So it's an approach to teaching. But in, in addition to that, you have to have a curriculum, you have to have tasks that tie into that approach. And Gina will talk a little bit more about asset-based versus deficit-based. But really what you need is you need tasks, you need instructional strategies, you also need a change in mindset. Who can and cannot do math and what does it mean to do math? So there's a lot of things there. And so when people say, what is culturally relevant pedagogy? It's not just one thing. Oh, I do want to mention one thing, though. One of the things, uh, Gloria Latson Billings was one that coined the term culturally relevant pedagogy. We also have culturally responsive, culturally compatible. I'm going to talk about Latson Billings and her definition. One of the um, things that she said has to happen is one of the propositions is a ha for students to have a critical consciousness, not just students, but teachers as well. So it's not just about connecting to the students and their interests it's also helping students to think critically. First of all, learn about themselves, learn about their communities, teachers learning about students, but also thinking about mathematics, using it in a way that we can critically look at, you know, the status quo, what's going on, you know, what, what are these everyday things, these world events that are happening or just things happening in my community that I can actually make sense of with math. So that was a lot. <laughs> That's a lot, absolutely. <laughs> but it answered my question. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I mean, I can do the what and the why. I think I'm gonna start, I'm gonna flip it. I'm gonna do the, so what is it? 
I mean, when we talk about, you know, the work that I learned in Dr. Jones's class was really about the culturally relevant pedagogy, the Gloria Latson Billings framework. So if you're not familiar with that framework, the three major tenets are, first of all, academic excellence, right? So we expect that all students are brilliant. That's a mindset issue. We talk about growth mindset. This is more than that. This is knowing that all students and believing that they're brilliant and they bring knowledge, mathematical knowledge into the classroom, right? So that's one of the pieces. The other piece is also bringing that cultural competence, right? I'm caring enough about the math that you're doing and I wanna learn about it. And, and I wanna share the math that I do too. You know, we talk about real world math all the time it's really not real world. Many of the problems that we see in books are contrived. Real world math is the math that kids are actually doing with their families. And so how do we tie that into the standards and bring those into the classroom, like Dr. Jones said, as tasks, as activities, because that's going to build students' cultural competence. And I think sometimes it brings, the, well, I know it brings the community together, because the more I know about Mona and John and Shelly, the better I get to perform as a student because now I know how they best understand math, what they care about, the math they do in their everyday life. And then uh, the last part, which is the critical consciousness piece is like standing up for what's right, right? Kids say to me all the time in school, that's not fair. Well, what's not fair about it? And there's a lot of math that's tied to fairness. You know, we see that all the time in the media. We see that all the time in the news. And so I'll ask kids that. I'm like, what is the math that really proves that that's not fair? And kids get excited about learning about things that they really, really care about. And so like that, those three big ideas that Gloria Ladson Billings really brought forth are so important. And if we brought them into our classroom, I think they would rehumanize and bring them alive. Like they make me excited to want to learn math. The other piece is that rehumanizing piece. You heard Dr. Jones share part of my story, right? Well, I felt dehumanized in class because I was so like invisible. Like I literally use the word invisible when I talk about my schooling. So if I felt invisible, how many more students across this country feel invisible? And how, wouldn't we want them to be visible? And especially in our math classrooms, we know that math is one of those things that changes the quality of your life. We know that, right? People who know math have better financial literacy, sometimes can access resources at a better rate, understand how to save money. Like all of these things happen. And yet sometimes people say we're not good at math. Well, what if we looked at it through the culturally relevant pedagogy lens mm -hmm. and really honored all of these three tenants? What could classrooms be reimagined to be? So that's why I feel so passionate about it because she did so much for me that brought me alive. That's what I want to do for kids. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, without a doubt. I just soaking all that in from both of you. Um, wow. So you talked about tasks, instructional strategies, what it means to do math and, and mindsets and beliefs and just so, so much more. Um, as I think about math leaders and, and, and leaders being catalysts for, for change and, and doing this work, um, what, what would you say that every math leader must know about culturally relevant mathematics? And what advice would you give to you know, the new math leader or frankly, the experienced math leader um, as they, they pursue this critical endeavor. Um, I, I sort of want to add on to when we were talking about the critical consciousness part, right? That critical part, I think, terrifies teachers. In fact, I know it does. And it terrifies elementary school teachers because they don't think their students are ready for things that are critical. Well, we're going to talk about things that are critical at their age, right? Something that is relevant to their age. For instance, I had a fourth grade student, actually a teacher who um, taught fourth grade and a student of hers wanted to do a project on the styrofoam trays that they were using in the lunchroom. So we're gonna gear it to the age that we're talking about. And she didn't like that. And so maybe she didn't think it was fair that we they were doing that. And so, we have to help leaders, first of all, understand that this critical component is needed, right? Because kids are experiencing critical things in their lives every day. And so we can't just 
hide behind the classroom and say, well, no, that doesn't belong in the classroom. We have to find a way to get it into the classroom. But leaders, we have to be bold and we have to help our teacher, teachers to understand where it belongs, right? Where does it belong in the math classroom? We have to look for places where it can belong because otherwise teachers won't do it because they don't think their administrators uh, will allow it. Okay, the other thing is administrators, you have to find a way to be on a level playing field with your stakeholders, with the, with the community. You have to find uh, opportunities and time for teachers to interact with the community, with parents, with all stakeholders, but on the same footing. Because many times uh, community members, they feel like the teachers and the administrators are up here and we're down there. Our voices don't count as much. And it, for, for those communities that they feel like their voices are heard, that's good but we need to make sure all stakeholders are being heard. And that means to bring them in as intellectual partners, not just as, I'm not saying any of these roles are, are wrong or bad, but we, we can't keep uh, certain communities where you know, they're uh, classroom helpers, they're um, you know, going on a trip and, and helping out on the trip, you know? we have to bring them in as intellectual partners where their voices are heard and they feel like they're making, helping to make decisions. So those are some of the things I think that uh, leaders can do to be bold and to advocate for culturally relevant pedagogy. And I would just add on to that, like we know that the data is telling us what we're doing right now is not working. So right away, that tells me we need to try something different. And the reality is, is when I look across my classrooms, they're very diverse. And even if you didn't work in a diverse um, school, let's say, because I get pushback on that, like, oh, our school's not the diverse, that diverse, we don't need culturally relevant. Well, we're entering a global society. We know that because of the internet and now Zoom, kids are interacting and are gonna be in careers where they're gonna interact with people all over the world. They're gonna be global citizens of this career, whatever they decide. And so if they don't have cultural competence, then what are we really building in students, right? We want them to be culturally competent. We want them to use their mathematical knowledge and be able to understand that other people are bringing knowledge to the field too. So to me, it's a win-win because if your classrooms are diverse, you're gonna build up everybody, but even if they're not, you're building up skills that they're gonna need regardless of where they're headed in life because the world is just changing so quickly. The other piece I would say why we need to advocate for it is because when we talk about those three big ideas, I've been thinking about this deeply. Like not only do students need that, teachers need that. Like teachers need to believe that we also need to believe our teachers are brilliant, right? And we need to think asset-based in terms of our teachers. We need to build our teachers' cultural competence, right? I'm learning about new cultures every single day and also need to build up my critical consciousness because as teachers, we need to be advocates for this type of instruction. So this culturally relevant framework, like if I really was to think about it deeply, we need it for our teachers and we also need it for our students because those three components are really gonna help bring us together. Like I think about, right, we're in very trying times. There's so many divisions, but if there was cultural competence and we understood each other better, could uh, we be in a better place? If we knew math at a different and we were sharing ideas, would we still be having these terrible debates? I don't really know, but what I know is right now people are super confused about a lot of things. And I think it's because they don't see the similarities that we share because we're not in the same room talking about these ideas. So that's some of my reasons why we need to advocate for this type of pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you both, you both use the term advocate, which I appreciate because that is one of the guiding principles of the framework for leadership in mathematics. The, you know, the, the book from <laughs> the book from NCSM book from the essential action series. I should know this, right? <laughs> anyway, but advocate is one of the guiding principles. So when we think about this and we know from what you guys are sharing with us and, and what I, what we just know is something we need to do more of. 
what do leaders need to consider as they are designing these opportunities and experiences and empowering those that they serve, giving voices to everyone? You know, what should they be considering as they work towards this culturally relevant mathematical practices, as well as the instructional resources? We've talked about tasks. So what are some of the, you know, top, say, if you give me the top three things or top five things to do, where, where can I start? If I know that I'm not there yet, what would be some good things to consider? So if we're talking about, I always say the easiest place, it's not easy, but the place to start is with the tasks, right? Because teachers have control over which tasks we assign our students. And so the metaphor that I like to use is the Rudine Sim Bishop, which is windows and mirrors. And if you've never heard that before, that's what you wanna provide for your students. So for those of you who have never heard that, mirrors are tasks that are reflections of me. So if I was to present a task or share some math that I do within my family, that's a mirror of me. But that would be a window for Mona or John or Shelly because that's something new to them that maybe not a math, maybe not a way that they do math. At the same time, I need to be learning from Shelly and Mona and John about the math that they're doing and therefore looking through the window and also looking even beyond my classroom walls, you know, bringing in other stakeholders. So I think the place to begin is with tasks. Like even if you have a textbook, right, that's, you know, just generic, could you look at it and say, to your class, is there a task here that's even related to something that you know about? And then take that and launch it into something that they do know. So even if you don't have a lot of materials, but what I'm afraid of is we're picking tasks that have contexts that are so unrelated to them and they have no background knowledge and they're not passionate about, and are we losing kids that way? Mm. So I would say start with the tasks. And I want to mention something that Gina did when we were doing our, um, I said we did, did a, a couple of workshops together. We did a couple of sessions together. So she decided, well, let's just teach kids about the mirror and window. And she went into a classroom and as she's teaching the teacher, she's teaching the students. And Gina did um, a, a lesson about uh, math that she saw in her life. And she talked about, I think your dad played soccer and your mom makes cakes and the layers in the cake and the multiplication. And so she talked about her mirror. And then she had students say, well, what, what's your mirror? Like, where do you see math? And the students came up with things like, you know, sports, food, and, and some other contexts but you can't get them to sit down when they're talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. And they got up and they, and they wanted to tell their stories. And so mathematics is used to, numbers are used to tell stories. And so if we can get students to tell stories. And I also like something Gina said about thinking about this in terms of teachers too. I don't know if I've ever thought about it that way the, the, the uh, deficit base versus the asset base and making sure when we talk about teachers may not know how to do that, this, we need to think about it in a positive way. You know, what do teachers know how to do and how can we connect that to what we want them to do with culturally relevant pedagogy? And I hadn't thought about it that way, but it's so true. And so we need to really work with teachers from that asset based thought. Um, I think that the, par the part that I really would want um, administrators to know and leaders to know is to, to, to start with that rigorous curriculum. Because as Gina said, one of the tenets is academic excellence, right? Or academic achievement. So therefore you need to have cognitively demanding math tasks. So that means we're, we're not going to bring in community funds of knowledge and we're not going to make connections to students and then and, and i hate this word but i'll say it dummy down the math we're, we're not doing that we're still holding math in the high esteem that we've always held it in and so we're going to have rigorous mathematics we're going to have a rigorous curriculum and so one of the things that leaders can do is look in their curriculum and see what's a culturally relevant friendly math content area for instance, geometry. Well, geometry has shapes. Well, there's shapes all over the world. 
We could talk about quilting. We could talk about different types of housing. You know, so think of math friendly curriculum, the culturally relevant friendly curriculum, math content areas. And I think statistics and probability uh, tell the stories with numbers, geometry, because we're talking about shapes. So those are some areas in math that I think easily or more easily change over to a coach. You can revise a task to be more culturally relevant. So I would say look for look for those areas and also, you know, finding that time to to really have teachers work on this, not only learning about what it is, but have the teachers and have your leaders get together and, and revise your curriculum, because there's not going to be a math program out there that's going to suit you uh, 100 percent. You're going to need to tweak it. You're going to need to revise those math tasks. It doesn't mean every task has to be a project. I think some leaders think that they have to have these grand projects to be culturally relevant. No, you can revise one task. You can revise one task and then the next time revise another task. And so those are some ways that I think, go ahead, Gina, sorry. I was just gonna add on like, and what's interesting is like, when you do that, you truly get to see their funds of knowledge and then that saves you on the assessment time because we're always busy like getting to these formal assessments, but in these informal tasks of culturally relevant, you really get to see what students know and don't know. So it's actually, it's serving two purposes. Like some people say, I don't have time. I'm like, you don't have time to see what your kids know. That's like the most important job we have in math is to find out where they are and they're thinking, right? Absolutely. So now you have this opportunity, but I think it's the way we frame it. So like, hey, I've got this really cool task and you get to find out exactly what kids know about math and you get to know because it is leaning into what they understand and context they understand. And you get a different assessment point, which means now I might be able to actually skip a couple of things because I know now they know a whole bunch of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's where people say like, I don't have time. I'm like, you can buy time. <laughs> that's how you buy time. Absolutely. Well, you both, hey, Shelly, you talked about it. it doesn't have to be this grand project. And, and, and Gina, you also talked, um, that you do have time. Um, and it makes me think about what's misunderstood. And I, I know you both are out there working with teachers, coaches, leaders, teams. Um, tell us one thing, maybe two, um, that you believe to be misunderstood about culturally relevant uh, mathematics. Um, I, I think that Teachers think um, when you when you tune into student interests, you know, like sports and entertainment and gaming, that it's culturally relevant, and that and that is not enough. I won't say that that's not culturally relevant, but that's relevant to an age group, and we do that pretty well. It's it's the other connections that we don't make with students. So I think that's one um, misunderstanding. I would say another one, just a quick one is people, and again, with a good heart, they swap out names and they think that makes it culturally relevant. So if I put in an ethnic name, but the context, like it just, it's not enough. I appreciate the effort, but it's really not enough. And it actually is does more damage because I'll be honest, like for my EL kids, they don't know if it's a math word or a name because math words are confusing anyways. And then you put in like this very cultural name. It, it just, it doesn't make it culturally, it makes it culturally confusing. I'm gonna be <laughs> culturally confusing. <laughs> so I appreciate it and ask your kids and use like their funds of knowledge and have them be the creators of the space for centering mm -hmm. students is was what I would say would be like a misconception Mm -hmm. um, it's more than that and it deserves more than that. If you hear the whole framework, I think, you know, you both would agree that it's more of, it's, it's deeper than that. Sure. Excellent. Thank you both. Yes. So thank you guys for your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, the good news is this is the beginning of a journey, not the end of the journey. Um, we both, um, so Gina is our professional learning director and she's one of our presenters at the Summer Leadership Academy. The title of our academy this summer is Ensuring Equitable Practices Through Bold Mathematics Leadership. And we are going to continue this conversation there, really focusing in on what are those leadership actions needed 
similar to what we've been discussing today, but we'll go more in clearly more in depth during the mm -hmm. Summer Leadership Academy. And that's June 28th to June 30th. And this year it's virtual. So you don't have to travel. You can just come from your bedroom window, your bedroom window, your bedroom. <laughs> Uh, through the bedroom window, Mona. Yeah, that window. was that was random. Of mirrors and windows. That's what yeah, that, was, that was it. You were messing me up there. But anyway, so um, you can join us there to learn more about it. But I just want to say thank you, guys, both of you, for joining us today. We really appreciate your your sharing your stories and sharing your connections with how we really impact learning for all students, for each and every student. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so and much, Mona and John. Thank you. And Gina. Yes, thank you. And honestly, thank you for creating a full circle moment for me to be able to be with Dr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We hope you have been inspired by this bold mathematics leadership conversation and will tune into our podcast series each month. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. You can learn more about NCSM Leadership in Mathematics Education and our upcoming professional learning events on the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. You can also follow NCSM on Twitter at mathedleaders using the hashtag NCSMBold. Thanks again.